We we'll now move on to questions to the Minister of Justice, and I call William Irwin to ask the first question. Question number one, Mr. Speaker. My department, in partnership with the Northern Ireland Policing Board, currently provides annual funding of approximately four and a half million to the eleven policing and community safety partnerships that exist across Northern Ireland. Following engagement and consultation, PCSPs identify and prioritise local community safety issues in order to improve community safety, tackle antisocial behaviour and increase confidence in policing. Each PCSP, made up of elected, independent and statutory members, then agrees on the appropriate allocation of funding towards programmes that help address local community safety issues, including road safety. Over recent years, a number of PCSPs have responded to road safety concerns and have provided funding for the purchase and deployment of speed indicator devices to help address those concerns. Given the ongoing priorities within my department, constraints on budgets, and recognising that road safety sits under the broad policy responsibility of the Department for Infrastructure, the Department of Justice is not in a position to provide additional funding to PCSPs expressly for the purpose of enabling them to fund more speed indicator devices. I am, however, content that should community demand for local SIDs increase, PCSPs have sufficient flexibility within their action plans and within existing budgets to work with the PSNI and DFI colleagues to support further rollout. Supplementary, William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her response. Uh, given the importance of road safety, would the Minister agree with me that speed indicator devices are an effective way to help highlight uh, speed awareness? With respect to the effectiveness of SID devices, a joint committee comprising representatives from my department and the Northern Ireland Policing Board oversees the work of PCSPs. All PCSPs provide the Joint Committee with quarterly PCSP action plan, delivery progress reports and are used, uh, required to use an outcome-based accountability model to measure the effectiveness of the services and interventions they support. To take just a recent example, reports from Uri Morn and Down PCSP for the final quarter of 2020-21 showed that for the seven speed indicator device signs installed across the district at that time, on average 10% of motorists reduced their speed due to the presence of the devices. They are therefore a useful tool, but only as part of the broader panoply of measures used to improve road safety outcomes. The data captured by the devices is governed and shared locally with the PCSP, PSNI, DFI and relative, relevant community organisations. Following analysis, <clears throat> that data is used by the PSNI to identify traffic patterns and informs the deployment of enforcement teams. It can also be benef beneficial to DFI when they are considering where to place new tra traffic calming measures. I call Cal Boylan, yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to thank the Minister for answers. Minister, just in this to the speed indicator devices, I mean, there does be complaints about traffic, calming ramps, ramps in particular, so this is an alternative measure. So, would the Minister undertake to have a conversation with the Infrastructure Minister to ensure that these speed indicator devices are rolled out where necessary and where appropriate? Government of Margaret. I thank the member for his question. Um, my understanding is that the use of SIDs are not an alternative to traffic calming measures, but can be used by the Department for Infrastructure to identify where traffic calming measures may be appropriate. However, based on the fact that this issue has been raised um, by members of PCSPs and indeed by members of the Assembly, I have also recently written to the Department for Infrastructure um, and to the Minister Nicola Mallon um, just to assess the role that her department might play in terms um, of being able to either assist or guide the rollout of SIDs in an appropriate way. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. Speaking of um, indicator devices, does the Minister think that she might need a truth indicator device when it comes to the HMIC report, given that a key premise of that report, namely that there was an events company with which the PC, PSNI cooperated, not least on road safety, now turns out to be false? If there was no such company, how can the Minister sustain the position that she welcomes what she called a comprehensive report. Well, Mr. Speaker, to be clear, I need no such device in terms of honesty, integrity, or truth. And it's fairly clear that the member in question doesn't need a shoehorn either, given that he managed to turn that into a question that had nothing to do with the substantive issue. Thank you, and I call Sinead Annis. 
Question two. Following the 2019 recommendation for the Criminal Justice Inspectorate for Northern Ireland that the Department consider how to address potential inadequacies in the law around strangulation, in the summer of 2020 I commissioned a review on non-fatal strangulation offences. The review aims to identify and address any inadequacies in the current policy and legislation on non-fatal strangulation. The scope of the review was later extended to include consideration of the rough sex defence, so-called, reflecting the similar legislative consideration being given to that issue during the passage of the Westminster Domestic Abuse Act 2021. My officials have conducted research and have taken account of relevant legislative and judicial developments in other jurisdictions locally and internationally. An expert stakeholder reference group was also established to assist with this work. I am pleased to report that the work is at an advanced stage. The review team is now finalising a report for public consultation on non-fatal strangulation offences. The consultation will set out relevant background information and research and seek public and relevant stakeholders' views on the most appropriate way forward for the criminal justice system to respond to cases of non-fatal strangulation. The consultation will be launched in the coming weeks. Well, yeah, and I welcome the Minister's um, clarification there. Obviously, the review on non-fatal um, strangulation offences is a crucial piece of work, and I welcome the, the work that has been done. Um, so, c- can the Minister just confirm then whether the, um, the outcome of the review on non-fatal um, strangulation offences, whether she anticipates that that will indeed be reflected in any changes to, to her Justice Bill? The issue um, of, of non-fatal strangulation may yet um, make the Justice Bill, but if it does so, it will be as an amendment. There is some discussion um, around whether that is the most appropriate mechanism, but certainly in terms of the rough sex defence, that will be dealt with in terms of the Justice Bill, at least as a first pass. There are a number of issues the member will be aware that come to play in terms um, of non-fatal strangulation um, and indeed the consent to cause harm. Um, and as you will be aware, we want to finish the consultation process before reaching a final conclusion with respect to that. One of the issues about the maximum se- uh, sentence, where that is tried um, on, as an indictable only offence, the maximum sentence is actually discretionary life. Um, however, in some cases this is dealt with um, in the magistrate's court where the maximum sentence is six months um, to 12 months for a small number um, of indictable offences that can be tried summarily in the magistrate's court. I know that at least one member of the judiciary, um, District Judge McElholm, has raised his concerns um, about the issue of both judicial training um, and also the level of offence and penalty um, for non-fatal strangulation, all of which we want to consider as part of the review. I call Michelle McElveen. My officials in the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service recently published their modernisation vision statement, which set out ambitious plans to deliver independent, fair and effective modern courts and tribunals to serve the people of Northern Ireland. The document acknowledges the current state lacks the current estate, lacks the flexibility and technological capacity required of a modern justice system, and outlines how a more consistent standard of accommodation will be delivered through an evidence based asset management and investment. In spite of the obvious delays in construction that have been caused by the pandemic, my officials in the Courts and Tribunal Service have continued to manage improvements in buildings right across Northern Ireland, with investments both strategic and tactical, comprising smaller scale maintenance works and larger capital projects. This year, our energy efficiency upgrade will continue with projects on site in Downpatrick, Ballymena, Coleraine and Armagh, and others progressing through design and procurement stages. More than 40 courtrooms across the next estate have been upgraded to install modern audio and video conferencing technology, which allows remote and hybrid hearings and facilitates digital display of evidence. The courtroom technology programme was essential in allowing courts to continue throughout the pandemic and will continue in the coming months, further increasing access to justice and boosting digital capability. In relation to Newt Nards, plans are well advanced to upgrade and replace all windows at the building. This project will address long-standing maintenance issues and improve energy efficiency. It is anticipated that works will commence over the summer months. The Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service will continue to take forward a range of improvement works to ensure that courts and tribunal buildings are fit for purpose and can support the delivery of physical, virtual and hybrid services. 
Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, for her answer. And, and I do welcome the improvement works that she has announced, in particular for Newton Arts um, Courthouse. But can I seek an assurance from the Minister that it is not her intention to rationalise the estate any further, and, and particularly for Newton Arts Courthouse, as her party colleague, who had previously held the portfolio, had suggested, given the need for services such as these in our smaller towns? It is widely recognised that many of the buildings in the court estate are not fit for purpose with most old, a number listed, and some, even with investment, not able to meet the standards that I think people have the right to expect. This does not mean that there are existing plans to close any buildings at this stage. There is no court closure list. Instead, Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service has completed a comprehensive technical survey of the entire estate, which will provide the data necessary to make informed investment decisions over the next five to ten year period. An estate strategy and strategic asset management plan are under development. These documents will set out how the physical estate will support the full range of next business and the levels of investment that will be required. That strategy will be subject to engagement with all stakeholders, including elected representatives. Alan Chambers, supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Uh, following the uh, welcome refurbishments of numerous courts around Northern Ireland, can the Minister confirm how many cases in the backlog caused by COVID this investment has helped to, to clear? Thank you. It wouldn't be possible, um, it wouldn't be possible um, Mr Speaker, um, to link particular cases and numbers uh, with the work that we have done. However, if we look at what we have been able to do, I can perhaps outline the work that has been done and then a little bit about progress on recovery. 44 courtrooms have been upgraded to date. Over £1 million has been spent on courtroom technology. We have also included remote working facilities maximised, so 300 laptops and Wi-Fi enabled PCs have been provided to staff to allow them to work not only in places in the courthouse where they don't um, have um, network points, but also to be able um, to facilitate working from home. We have also included the Nightingale accommodation in the International Conference Centre to allow coroner's court hearings, tribunal business and welfare appeals, small claims courts, pre-hearing consultation space and jury assembly to, to uh, free up um, some um, of the room that we have in Lagonside Court. There are also now 66 site link licences and 70, uh, 17 WebEx in operation according, across the court facility to allow us um, to have um, both hybrid um, and virtual hearings. And we've also installed 27 additional video conference, conferencing units in courtrooms. Just prior to the COVID lockdown, there were around um, 8,100 criminal cases in the court system. With the closure of courts over the first lockdown, this rose to approximately um, 12,800 cases by early September last year. With the reopening of most courts since August 2020, there have been more magistrates' cases disposed by the courts than received. So the current real-time management information suggests that we now have a case of around 10,500 cases. Um, and indeed, children's order cases are being dealt with currently at a rate which precedes lockdown levels by around 20 per cent. However, as members will be aware, I have made a bid for court recovery as part of the uh, budget plans, and uh, I am hopeful that that will be received positively by the Department for Finance. I think I call John Blair. Speaker, the question has just been asked, but, but I will keep trying. Thank you. And, uh, I call Nicola Brogan. Um, I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Can the Minister advise us on how long she anticipates the Nightingale court Courts to continue to be used? At the moment, we have a contract which takes us up um, to the end of June. Um, however, we continue in discussions um, with the management of the, um, of the centre around potentially being able to continue that through the summer. Obviously, much will depend on the relaxations and whether or not conferencing business will be able to restart. But given the strictures around travel regulations, I think international conferencing in particular may still be in quite a depleted state um, come that point. And so they may be welcoming of a tenant that continues through the summer period. But we will keep members obviously informed of any changes. Call Dinah McCrossan. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the answers to your questions so far. Minister, pre-COVID, courthouse estates, court estates were used uh, for uh, appeals for people uh, going through the, the benefits uh, process. Uh, I'm just wondering, does the Minister believe that's an appropriate use of the estate, and does she believe that the estate is up to date enough uh, to ensure dis- disability access, given that there's heavy doors, no real automatic door opening, and the difficulty in parking? Well, I think the member has set out very clearly what I referenced in my answer um, to uh, Ms McElveen, which is that the courts of state often fall short of the highest standards that we would wish to have because they are old historic buildings. Very often they are listed and therefore we can't make changes. It is, of course, appropriate um, that tribunal cases would be heard within the courts and tribunals um, system because it is not, of course, just the court system. It actually includes tribunals um, and it's important that we're able to do that. We do have extensive plans, however, for modern modernisation um, and uh, one of the big pieces that we're looking at, one of the first pieces, will be to provide a very modern um, facility um, in the North West in order that we can match the kind of facilities that we've been able to provide in the Greater Belfast area. I call Linda Dillon. A good can call you and thank the Minister for answers. Kirst Ever Cahar. Question number four. The Minister of Finance is leading on engagement with the UK Government on behalf of the Executive in relation to funding for the Troubles Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme. However, in addition to participating in meetings involving the First Minister, Deputy First Minister and the Finance Minister, I have also raised the issue separately with the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland on a number of occasions at meetings and in correspondence. The most recent meeting with the Secretary of State relating to the scheme was held on 7 April 2021. I attended that meeting with the First Minister, Deputy First Minister and the Finance Minister. The meeting was arranged following an offer made by the Secretary of State to provide access to £100 million of new decade new purse funding for the financial years 2022-23 to 2025-26, where the financial pressures of the scheme on the Executive are expected to be greatest. The Secretary of State indicated that no further funding would be made available for the scheme. However, he agreed to a further meeting later this year when more detailed information would be available on the profile of applications to the scheme, which would inform more accurate estimates of cost. On the basis of the estimated cost of the scheme, we expressed strongly to the Secretary of State our collective position that the offer of financial support falls considerably short of what was expected and that the UK Government would need to provide additional funding to avoid such a financial strain on the Northern Ireland Block Grant. I also raised concerns about the impact on funding for proposed legacy arrangements if the funding was being diverted from that set aside for the arrangements envisaged in New Decade New Approach. Discussions with the Secretary of State and the UK Government will continue. In the meantime, an undertaking has been provided to the courts that payments will be made to successful applicants under the scheme. That is important reassurance, Mr Speaker, to victims that payments will be made when they fall due under the terms of the scheme, regardless of where the funding comes from. Linda Dillon, supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her answer. I do think it is important that victims do know that, regardless of, of what discussions are ongoing or what arguments there are with the British Government over who should be paying, that they will receive their money, and I think that is very important. Minister, could you outline if you have any, had any discussions or any approaches from the Secretary of State or the British Government in relation to their proposed legacy bill as outlined in the Queen's speech, given that it effectively gives an amnesty to British state forces and also rules out the possibility of any type of Article 2 compliant investigation. The Secretary of State um, has contacted, I think, the leaders of all of the executive parties to discuss um, the proposals that he intends to bring forward. As a party alliance have now met with the Secretary of State uh, on two occasions, um, and I anticipate there will be a further meeting to come in the days ahead. As Justice Minister, I have met with the Secretary of State on one occasion, specifically with respect to the impact on the justice system. And I have said that my officials um, are free to continue to engage with his officials in respect of the workability of any proposals that he may bring forward. To be clear, however, it is not my intention, either as Leader of Alliance um, or as Justice Minister, to be involved in co-design of any scheme that will lead to a full amnesty or that will disrupt the the outworking of the justice system, um, as would be anticipated under Article 2. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer so far. And, and I want to thank the Minister as well for the work that her department has done on the, the, permanent disablement, uh, the Victims' Permanent Disablement Payment Scheme. Um, it is really appreciated. Could, but could I ask the Minister, just, just for her view, what, does she believe that payments will start to be made this financial year? Well, I think it's a very positive development that the President has indicated his intention that the scheme will open from the 30th of June. It is a complex scheme, <clears throat> and a number of operational issues are currently being progressed in advance of the scheme opening for applications. That includes design of the medical assessment service by Capita. It will be a matter for the Victims' Payment Board to confirm when payments may be made from the scheme, but that will depend on the number of applications, complexity of applications, and so on. I am aware, however, that the President and Victims' Payment Board are committed to ensuring that applications will be processed as expeditiously as possible um, under the regulations. I would expect that those more complete applications, which require less assessment, may well come to fruition within the current financial year. Well, Colin McGrath. Mr. Speaker, would the Minister agree with me that it makes sense that our Executive Office and our Ministers had an agreed position on trying to work with the British Government to get some funds from this, as I understand that they have not had any joint engagement with the British Government regarding the funding of the programme? Well, I think I stated in earlier answers that, in fact, um, the First and Deputy First Minister had met with the UK Government, um, along with myself and with the Finance Minister, to discuss these issues. And we have a collective position as an executive um, that the UK Government need to continue to make more significant contributions to this matter. You said that no engagement. They did. They call John Blair. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I thank the Minister for the detail given thus far around the Victims' Payment Scheme, but some um, uh, victims will have already died before being able to make an application to the scheme, of course, and others will sadly pass away before the scheme becomes operational. So can I ask the Minister what provision there is in place uh, to deal with these victims? I thank the member for his question. Just to return to the previous member's question, because he seems dissatisfied with the response that I gave. The UK Government are represented in these negotiations by the Northern Ireland Office. They are part of the UK Cabinet. Um, and therefore, when the First and Deputy First Minister engage with the Northern Ireland Office, they are engaging with the UK Government, which was the question that was asked. Furthermore, the Finance Minister is engaging with Treasury on the matter, and therefore the issue is being addressed um, at all levels of UK Government that is appropriate. With respect to those um, who have passed away in the interim and are unable um, to uh, therefore benefit from the, the, the um, claim itself, um, there is provision in the regulations um, for the board um, to, first of all, for the applicant to have a nominated beneficiary to receive a payment if they die after submitting their application. Also, in the regulations for the board to decide if someone may apply to receive such payments in the event that no one has been nominated. And further, the regulations also provide for posthumous applications and, as such, will ensure in cases where an individual who would have been entitled to victims' payments but passed away before being able to make an application may be made by a person the deceased could have nominated under the regulations. Next two members are not in their places, and I move to a question uh, for Mr. Alex Eason. Question number seven, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Department of Justice manages the third largest non ring fence resource Dell budget across the Northern Ireland departments, behind health and education, and has an annual budget of approximately £1.1 billion. Within the department, there are three core directorates, five executive agencies, and eight executive non departmental public bodies, including the Police Service of Northern Ireland. The Department manages a range of volatile and demand-led services, such as the payment of legal aid costs and criminal damage and criminal injuries compensation payments. Relative to the size and nature of the budget, the Department has successfully managed to minimise underspends in each of the last three years to around 1 per cent of the total final in-year non-ring fence resource Dell budget and around 3 to 4 per cent of the capital Dell budget. Underspends based on the financial outturn over the three financial years 2017-18, 2019-20 were non-fence ring, uh, ring fence resource Dale 4.3 million, 5.8 million and 8.9 million, which equates to 0 0.4, 0 0.6 and 0.8 of the final budget. With respect to Capital Dale, the underspends for the same years were 1.6 million, 3.2 million and 2.9 million which equates to 2.8%, 3.5% and 3.7% of the final budget. 
Final return for figures for 2021 will be available later this year. A significant area of underspend in non-ring fence resource style each year is in relation to compensation services and the settlement of claims for criminal damage and personal injury payments. These are particularly difficult to manage given the uncertainty around timing and value. The underspends in this area have been 2.2, 3 and 5.6 million respectively. Capital Dell underspends are mostly attributable to delays in projects across the Northern Ireland Prison Service, Court Service um, and Tribunal Service and Policing. Alex Easton, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer. Can I ask the Minister, can I ask you what processes are in place to ensure that your department ensure that all their budgets are spent to the best of their ability and offer best value for the budget that they're set for them? The Department always seeks to minimise underspends at year end and works very closely with the Department of Finance during monitoring rounds and the year end process. The Department has successfully delivered underspends for non ring fence. Uh, delivered underspends for non-ring fence resource Dell and capital Dell to within the acceptable levels for the last three years due to effective budget management. This is achieved largely by a continual process of keeping budgets under review and by taking part in the in-year monitoring process run by the Department of Finance. That is the opportunity to formally address pressures in-year and declare reduced requirements at each stage of the process. The next three members are not in their places and I will uh, now call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, sorry, question 10. Question 11. BOBC 1 for the redevelopment of the McGilligan site will be submitted to Financial Services Division within the next two months. Supplementary, Morris Bradley. Speaker, I thank the Minister for that uh, very short but very definite answer, uh, and it's good news, so thank you very much, Minister. It's more good news, short answers, short questions. Um, I now call Gary Middleton. Gary Middleton is not in his place. Mark Durkin is not in his place. Daniel McCrossan is in his place. You get a bonus. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I don't think we've ever got to all 15, 14 questions in, in, in the years since this Assembly has returned, so well done, Minister. Uh, Minister, question 14. I'm committed to implementing the full programme of reforms under the Gillen Review into law and procedures in serious sexual offences in Northern Ireland and to improving the experience of victims of these horrendous offences. I particularly recognise the vulnerability of victims who are children, and so my officials are establishing a cross-departmental steering group to provide strategic direction and oversee the coordinated implementation of the Gillen Review recommendations specific to providing support to child victims of serious sexual offences. A priority for the group in 2021-22 will be overseeing the development of a permanent protocol to extend and build upon the judge-led voluntary protocol to expedite serious sexual offence cases involving children under 13 that began in Belfast in September 2019. A dedicated working group is also being established to make arrangements for the incremental rollout of the protocol to one additional Crown Court within this financial year and all Crown Court areas within Northern Ireland thereafter. The judge-led protocol will continue to operate in tandem whilst this work is ongoing. Work to extend the protocol is just one element of the programme of work that the steering group will oversee. We anticipate that a number of other work streams will also be established to take forward the implementation of other recommendations under the Gillen Review, including the development of a pilot scheme to provide publicly funded independent legal advice, specifically for children, which would mirror the sexual, the sexual offences legal advice pilot, which my department launched last month in respect of adult victims, work to pilot and test arrangements for pre-recorded cross-examination and re-examination in serious sexual offence cases involving child victims, and finally, consideration of a Barnahouse-type model for Northern Ireland, which will bring all justice and therapeutic child services under a single roof. These additional work streams will complement work already underway, for example, to deliver improvements on achieving best evidence and to provide remote evidence centres where children can provide evidence away from the court building. Daniel McCross, the supplementary. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Minister gave a very detailed answer and has answered the supplementary in the body of that. Thank you. Sorry. Um, as I said, that now ends a period for a list of questions. Before we move on to topicals, I just want to make a point that I will be writing to all those members who have not been in their places today 
and that includes a number of people from remote as well. There is a lot of work being put into by the Department and Ministers to respond to the questions asked. So, as I say, I will be, there, there has been a recurring theme recently of an increase of this. So I just want to make the point that I will be writing to all those members uh, to make sure people are in their places in due course. Okay. Um, we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'll try and make this a bit longer. Uh, Minister, there have been many reports of attacks on our emergency staff over the last few months. Our hospital staff have gone above and beyond the call of duty during the pandemic, uh, and they and other emergency services deserve to feel safe in their place of work. Would the Minister be minded to review sentencing guidelines for incidents involving attacks on staff within our hospitals and our emergency staff on call to the aid of the general public? Um, I thank the member um, for his question. It is an issue which has actually been raised um, with me previously by the First Minister. Um, and she had asked that we look at the issue of first responders and others who may come into contact with the public and be attacked in their line of work. It is something that under the sentencing review um, which was undertaken we have given consideration to and we would be minded um, to look specifically at that area. As I have indicated previously, my intention would, bring, would be to bring forward a comprehensive um, sentencing bill um, in the next mandate. Um, and so work on that will, preparation of that will commence um, in the autumn and it will then be for whoever is Justice Minister um, from next May onwards um, to consider whether or not it is also a priority for them. Supplementary, Morris Bradley. Mr Speaker, and thank the Minister for that detailed answer. A bit longer than the last one. Thank you. Uh, Minister, uh, all remains for me to say is I look forward to the, the review coming back. I do think that stiffer sentences is, is the way to encourage uh, support and uh, I, I think it will be a big, big bonus for those people who work in the emergency service. They know that if they are attacked, the offender will get a, a just sentence. Thank you. Um, with respect to the sentencing, of course, that remains a matter for the judiciary, and it has largely been our approach uh, within the department to look towards setting the maximum limit at the right level so that as the judge um, has unfettered discretion, they are nevertheless aware of the seriousness of the offence uh, which they are taking forward. In this case, our intention is to look at those people who, in the line of their work, may be attacked in this way um, as an aggravator um, for any sentencing, uh, so that it would be seen as an aggravated offence if the person is a first responder. Call William Humphrey. The Minister for answer so far. Minister, can I ask you what progress is being made on the NDNA commitment of 7,500 police officers? Um, as the member will be aware, um, there were lengthy discussions around this issue um, as the budget um, was being set for next year. There was at one stage concern that due to the removal of Brexit funding from Westminster and a number of other issues, including the flat cash budget, which we got in the department. Um, that we would end up in a situation where we actually had a reduction in police numbers, which I think would have been very unhelpful. However, um, thanks to some hard work done um, by the Department um, of Justice and, I have to say, other executive colleagues who took a particular interest in this matter, including um, his own um, former party leader, um, we have been able to secure additional resource, first of all to secure um, at 7,000 officers um, the complement of the PSNI at the moment, um, and also um, to secure additional funding that will allow the PSNI to start to recruit an additional 100 um, officers this year. Um, it will then be a matter for future um, budgets to ensure that that is baselined and built upon going forward. So we have made some progress, not as much as I think any of us would like, but I think given the current financial situation, um, it, is to, it is commendable um, that we are able at least to start moving in the right direction, as opposed to what may have been the case that we were actually regressing. Supplementary, William Humphrey. Can I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, Minister, the story funeral and the uh, events around it have clearly caused reputational damage to the PSNI. The barrister-led inquiry at City Hall and the HMI uh, C report have not provided the clarity and certainty the general public requires. Does the minister believe that an independent inquiry, a judge-led independent inquiry, is both, would be both helpful and provide that clarification, and that certainly the general public needs going forward, and give them confidence in the PSNI again? 
Well, I think it is a big step to suggest that there isn't general confidence in the PSNI. That is not um, my experience, certainly in dealing with the public and talking to people who um, I engage with at constituency level and also um, as minister. However, increasing confidence in PSNI is all of our responsibilities as elected representatives. Where there are issues, we ought to engage constructively with the PSNI and with communities to build that confidence. Um, I have yet to see any kind of substantive reason um, for any kind of judge-led inquiry, and I am clear that I will not cross the boundary of trying to usurp the role of the policing board, uh, which has the authority and responsibility for scrutiny of the PSNI. Many of the gaps that have been raised and many of the issues that have been raised around HMIC and their report in particular are matters that do not pertain um, to uh, HMIC and were never part of their remit. However, if the policing board and its members have questions in respect of those matters, they are of course free to place those questions um, with the Chief Constable and to seek a response and indeed could go down the route um, of commissioning their own inquiry um, into those matters that would allow them to get to the detail of what they need in terms of the policing operation itself. With respect to um, the report from Belfast City Council, it is well outside my jurisdiction these days to comment on Belfast City Council, much as both um, members and indeed the Speaker may have done so in the past. Okay, and I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for answers thus far. Minister, you will be well aware of the continued public outcry in relation to the Bobby Story funeral fiasco. If Island Events Company didn't provide security and stewarding, then who did? Thank you. Well, I think the first thing to say, Mr. Speaker, is that I understand the real hurt and frustration that many people still feel around the events um, surrounding that funeral. I'm especially mindful of those who lost loved ones during the pandemic and of the fact that many of them, um, I think, were hurt um, by the fact that whilst they stuck to the rules, others didn't. I'm also very conscious that Mr Story too has a grieving family um, and that every time this is raised it has an impact on them. So I think we need to proceed sensitively when we deal with these issues. Questions about who provided the security and stewarding around the funeral are simply not a matter for me as Justice Minister. I have no locus in respect of matters that are the operational responsibility of the Chief Constable and I must respect his operational independence. The Northern Ireland Policing Board, as the PSNI's accountability body, will be receiving a written response from the Chief Constable on the findings of the inspection by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary, Fire and Rescue Services. The Board can then ask further questions if there remain areas of uncertainty, and the Chief Constable has already indicated he is happy to address any questions that the Board wish to put to him. Harry Harvey, Supplementary. Thank you, Kian Speaker. <clears throat> The entire justice system has suffered serious reputational damage from its handling of all this. What further investigation will you direct as Justice Minister to answer this particular question? Thank you. Well, there is no doubt the decisions of both the PSNI and indeed the PPS in regard to the events were the subject of intense public interest. The mechanisms that govern the operation of the justice system are designed to ensure that operational decisions are kept free of political interference, and that includes by the Justice Minister. Under the tripartite accountability arrangements, the policing board is the key accountability mechanism for the PSNI, not the Justice Minister, and not with due respect to this House, the Assembly Chamber. The board comprises a balance of political representatives and independent members who are collectively tasked with ensuring an effective, efficient, impartial, representative and accountable police service, which will secure the confidence of the whole community. The Public Prosecution Service is also reviewing its decision. Given the PPS is operationally independent of me as Justice Minister, I will quite rightly play no role whatsoever in that process. Until such times as those processes are fully worked through and exhausted, I think it would be premature to consider whether there are sufficient substantive issues as to require any further action on my part. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, Karen Corley, I'm Minister, I acknowledge your acknowledgement of the grief of Bobby Story's funeral every time this subject is raised, because it's quite clear those who raise it don't care about Bobby's funeral. And they're using the grief of others who were hurt by the events around Bobby's funeral as a political football, and they should be ashamed of themselves. But in regards to well, the point I wish to raise with you, Minister, is this. 
Will you join with me in condemning the comments from the Loyalist Community Council at Westminster last week, where they once again threatened the use of violence? Mr Speaker, I have no hesitation in condemning any group, any organisation, which suggests that violence is still a way to further their political objectives. Violence should never be on the table. It should never have been on the table, and it should be firmly off the table as we stand here today. People making those comments are doing so recklessly, without thought to the people. We have talked about victims in this session today. We have talked about legacy. We have talked about the hurt of grieving families. And every time people threaten violence, it is those people and people like them who will be affected in the future if that comes to pass. So I would ask people seriously to de-escalate some of the language they use around these issues. It is neither helpful to their cause, nor is it appropriate in what is meant to be a lawful society. Is it not the case that those political parties who meet with the LCC uh, give them a status they don't deserve? And while I, I recognise wholly that everyone should use their efforts to encourage groups to unarm and disband, meeting these groups in common cause for a political objective is the wrong way forward, and that the only item on the agenda, not the first item, not the last item, the only item on the agenda for these meetings should be this. When are you disbanding? Well, Mr Speaker, I am on record previously as having said that it is the only question on which I would be willing to engage with the LCC. Because until loyalist paramilitarism has ended, until those organisations that are involved with it and any other paramilitary organisation have gone away, then we are not in a situation where we have normal society and normal operation of society. While the coercive control structures of any illegal organisation are still operating in our society, it is completely unacceptable. And it is incumbent on unionist politicians, it is incumbent on nationalist politicians, it is incumbent on all of us to make clear statements in that regard and to follow it through with our actions. I have no difficulty whatsoever in engaging with the Loyalist community, but I refuse, I refuse, Mr Speaker, to equate the Loyalist community with Loyalist terrorists. I call Linda Dillon. Anne Corlea, and thank the Minister for answers. Minister, we as a committee are awaiting the Justice Bill coming forward. It was supposed to come forward, come through the Executive a number of weeks ago. And I'm just wondering, could you outline what the blockage is? Is that blockage within the executive? And given that all of the parties, as far as I'm aware, in the, co in the committee have stated that they want to see those items that are on the Justice Bill coming forward, is there a specific party that are blocking this in the executive? Well, I thank the member um, for her question. Drafting of the Justice Bill is complete, and the Bill contains important provisions which will protect people from serious sexual offences and sexual exploitation. I circulated an executive paper to executive colleagues for approval on the introduction of the Bill um, on the 27th of April. Despite the content of the Bill being widely supported, as the member has said, I was unsuccessful in my attempts to get approval of the Bill onto the agenda for executive meetings of the 6th, 13th and actually the 20th of May, where it was tabled but for discussion only. I have written to the First and Deputy First Ministers on three separate occasions in an effort to progress introduction of the Bill without success. As yet, I have not been able to determine any substantive reason why that is the case. The content of the Bill, as it is now drafted, was approved by Executive on 19 November 2020, and no new content has been added in the interim. Mr Speaker, I am growing increasingly concerned that any further delay will see the Bill fail to progress in this mandate and there will be a gap in the public protection arrangements for the most vulnerable in our society as a result. This is especially true as I will not then be able to progress planned amendments to, for example, abolish the rough sex defence, which we were also queried about today, extend the existing revenge porn provisions to include a threat of publication or provisions to widen the scope and strengthen the current law on abuse of trust. These are public protection issues. They should not be controversial. I have spoken um, with the new leader of the DUP briefly at Executive in the hope that we will be able to meet before this, this Thursday's Executive to seek clarity on the issues around which the concerns lie um, and to get this bill cleared so that we are able to move forward. 
Time only for very brief supplementary brief response, please. Thank you, Minister. And as, if you, as you have outlined, there are a number of issues within the Justice Bill that we want to see come forward, particularly around protecting those who are victims of sexual and domestic violence. And we need to see that happen. If there is a party in this House that is blocking that within the executive, we need to know because that is not what is being articulated within the committee. So we need a response in order to move this forward. I accept the urgency of the issue, and I have been um, as blunt as the member knows I'm capable of being um, about the urgency of the issue. Um, I am clear that those who are currently holding the bill up do not object to the content of the bill as drafted. Their concerns are around potential amendments that may be brought forward once the bill comes to committee um, or once the bill is in front of the House. Mr Speaker, I raised this issue a number of times in the executive when it came to other bills and was told firmly by the same individuals that it was not the business of executive to try to constrain what might be brought forward on the floor of the House. So it would be quite a change in direction if they were trying to do so. And members, the time is up. Members, please take your ease before we start the next item of business. Jerry Carl, point of order. Mr. Speaker, I wasn't in my place for question times. Uh, business moves far, far quicker than I anticipated. So just.